Okay, we're gonna give people about one more minute since we're still slightly early. So if there's questions from the room during, um, I'll ask you to repeat them back because some um, people on Zoom won't be able to hear otherwise. So they might be able to hear them. This does do some kind of job picking up the background, but it's not that great. So just depending on how loud they are, mm -hmm. they not hear you. So. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, really be great to have um, Ann Padge Dog out here from um, Simulations Plus, and from what I understand, he gave a really great talk at the Comcam or the Computer Aid Drug Discovery GRC this summer on working with chemical data, which is something that I've done a lot of and probably not as much as him, and I've suffered a lot in doing, and so I'm really excited about learning from him on this and hearing about it. And it's also very relevant to work that the Open Force Field Initiative is doing, and I know we're, that we're doing in the lab as well. So this is also an open force field webinar. Um, so we have an audience on Zoom who may ask questions. So if you're on Zoom and you want to ask a question, you can um, certainly just shout at it, or we'll call on you at the end. And also, um, if you're trying to interrupt during, you're welcome to try to drop things into the chat window. I'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, and likewise, if there's problems with the audio, feel free to chime in in the chat window. Um, and we are recording this, so hopefully it'll be available to others later. So please um, go ahead and send that. Great. Thanks so much, David. And um, Open Force Field Initiative, especially John and others from Open Force Field who have, who thought that this could be an important talk for mostly uh, peop all the people working in the chemical informatics, especially doing the model building. So what I'll be discussing over here is the process of data curation. And I specifically mentioned here that this is the forgotten practice in the era of AI, because nowadays everybody is talking about AI or artificial intelligence and thinks that, okay, all we have to do is get the data and build the models. So it is not a QSAR modeling or model building is not just a push button approach, but it needs a lot of pre-processing of the data. So what I mean to say here is when you see the, um, any news or let me put it as a, any activity data, it is necessary that you validate that data prior to using it in your model building or believing it. And these are the two news actually which were, which have been published, which were, um, which appeared in news. One was about the Loch Ness Monster and the other one is a black uh, Bigfoot in California. Now, people believed these news for decades, actually. And until if you find someone who can mention that this is a fake news, you won't find it. I'll get back to this, these two photographs during my talk later. But this is something what we have to believe when you're dealing with the activity as well. We have to find out if there is anything wrong in the data or there is any fake data. So before I start my just uh, before I start my talk, I just want to mention that I do not want to evaluate or criticize any public or commercial databases here, because these databases are definitely useful, and just we cannot evaluate that, oh, these are wrong, these are bad data, or this is good data. So it is, my, my intentions are very straightforward. I just want to suggest how we can utilize these existing data databases efficiently and how we can advocate if, if I can advocate a strategy for data curation that is what I want to um, <clears throat> discuss over here so just to just before I enter into just before I discuss my outline I'd like to show why data curation is necessary so this is the email my colleague received few months back from one of our customer. And I'd like to highlight over here, it says we have run some test, test data sets through admit predictor and we have we get rather poor correlations. Now admit predictor is 
a software simulations plus distributes, which has more than 140 um, admit properties actually. So they were evaluating it and they found that the predictor is not giving us good predictions. And they shared few data sets with us. One of the data sets is for human liver microsomal clearance model. So they shared this link with us. They collected the data from Kimble and they compared, they predicted the HLM clearance from admit predictor and looked at the prediction versus experimental value. And this is the, this is the correlation they found. So looking at this correlation, they just mentioned, okay, we don't see a good correlation. When they shared this data with us, we got this data, we carried out some data curation and convergence. And what we see is a very good correlation. So what did these investigators miss? First of all, if you look at the, if they had looked at the predictor manual, we have specifically mentioned in our manual that the HLM clearance data is corrected for microsomal binding, they missed on that part. So first thing they missed was converting the bound clearance into the unbound clearance. So if you do that kind of conversion, you have a correlation which appears on the right hand side of the screen. Secondly, you cannot complete, you cannot use the data which are boundary data. Like for example, there were 80, 84 compounds which have been mentioned as greater than 150, or there were more than 250 compounds which were mentioned as less than three. You cannot use those data points when you are comparing the predictions. So if you remove those, if you carry out appropriate conversions and if you remove these compounds which are not relevant, then yes, we do see a good correlation. So this is what is happening. Everybody thinks that in case of AI, all you have to do is get the data, run the predictions, or get the data and build the models. This is the notion we want to change actually. And what kind of pre-processing is required, that's what actually, and what we faced during our pre-processing processing is something I will be discussing over here. So this is the outline of my talk. Only four points, what is data validation? Where are these errors coming from? And how do we find these errors? And finally, why should we care about them? This is, I already discussed one example that yes, we need to care about them. I'll definitely show more. So let's start with data validation. Data validation is, if you look at the dictionary meaning of validation, it just mentions that it is an action of checking or proving the validity of accuracy of something. And if we apply the same definition towards the data validation or data curation, what we are doing is this process of ensuring data have undergone data cleansing, that means the data curation, what we are doing to ensure that they have the data quality that is both correct and useful. And that is where actually the data, data curation or data cleaning comes into the picture. In drug discovery, validation is an absolute necessity. You cannot simply believe the data, specifically if you are extracting it from the big databases, you cannot simply believe those data actually. On an average, it has been shown that there are at least two errors in each medicinal chemistry paper. This is an, I'm just mentioning the average error. There could be more. There are papers which are absolutely perfect in terms of chemistry and biological data. And overall error rate can be as high as 8%. These errors, I'm not talking about the systemic errors or random errors. That is a different topic. I'm talking about the errors in the databases, which can be introduced during the data digit digitalization or data extraction from the papers. And if we want to build the accurate and predictive models, the clean data and the accurate data is absolutely necessary and it is mandatory. So if we see the databases which are available for bioactivity, the chemical databases or the bioactivity databases. There are tons of databases available actually. 
I wouldn't say tons of it, but tens of data sets. So we have Kimbell or PubChem or BindingDB. These are the free ones, but there are commercial databases like GoStar database or Receptor database or Clarivate database. So these are the ones which are commercial databases as well. So the usefulness of these public data sources is questionable actually because of the quality control which is lacking when these databases are built. So once we have the data, extracted the data, we cannot use it. We have to wash the data, we have to rinse the data, and sometimes we have to scrub the data. And this is what is necessary before model building, actually, before using the data for any purpose. So what I will be discussing here is simple, my, if there were no paper, there, were, there are few papers who have discussed about these data curations. So what I'm discussing here is only my experiences, only after sharing or after knowing what people have been doing. So what I'm showing here is I have my experiences after standing on the shoulder of the giants. So who are these giants? If we look at them, there are a few papers from, uh, there are a few papers in the literature, which is like Trust by Verify by Profta Group or there are from Tony Williams Loop. These are the data which are talking about chemical structure curation. So if you read these papers, most of these papers are talking about, oh, you have to standardize the data, you have to carry out neutralization, you have to use appropriate tautomers, you have to use desalting, you have to take, check, check the, if the compounds are mixtures or take care of the stereochemistry. So most of these papers do talk about chemical structure curation or chemical structure standardization. But there are few papers which are talking about bioactivity apart from the chemical structures. So these are recent papers which are mostly talking about the biological data. And <clears throat> but these people do not mention how these data curation, what are the troubles in data curation, or how do we find this? And this is what I will be talking about in this talk that where do we get these errors from? okay we have these databases where do we get the errors so there are various sources of errors i'll just start with simple data extraction so as i mentioned i do not want to badmouth any database or any authors actually so what i'm showing is simply the compound identifiers as compound x or compound y like without showing the actual um, database id or compound names actually. So if we look at this data from one database, what we extracted, the same compound has two different IC50 values. One is 56,000 nanomolar and one is 56 nanomolar. Now, if you go back to the references of these paper, this is just a reference in terms of Kimball, Kimball reference actually, just to, if anybody is interested in. This is a terfinadine. And one author mentions that terfinadine per IC50 is 56 nanomolar. And the other author mentions that terfinadine IC50 is again 56 nanomolar. So when the data extractor, database extractor, whoever extracted this data, he made a mistake in terms of instead of saying 56 nanomolar, he mentioned it as 56 micromolar, and that made a huge difference. If you just get this data and predict her guys 50 using any commercial model, you will see that, okay, one compound is predicted very well, the other compound is predicted by three log unit difference. And then people start comparing, oh, that model is not good, that commercial model is bad. So we have to be very careful when we are extracting the data. <clears throat> Second source of extraction is source of data error is again data extraction. Now, what I'm showing here is an example from commercial database. Here, bio, this is a decipramine, and bioavailability of decipramine is 0.15. If we look at this, it says activity is 0.15, which is a bioavailability. So that means bioavailability is 0.15. This looks quite realistic. Why? Because the range of fraction bioavailable or bioavailability is zero to one. So if I tell you that bioavailability is 0.15, people can believe it. But unless 
if you look at it as enzyme cell assay, now enzyme cell assay says that it is a fraction of compound unbound in human plasma. It is not a bioavailability. What they are discussing is plasma protein binding. And unfortunately or fortunately, the range of fraction unbound is zero to one as well. So until you look into these databases and dig in more what exactly these activity or these values are representing, you cannot, you should not be trusting the numbers as is. This is the classic example where the FU value or the 0.15 could be fraction unbound or bioavailable. But when you look at the assay, then you find out, oh, it is a plasma protein binding and not bioavailable. So these kind of errors need to be taken care of, uh, need to be uh, looked at actually when you are looking at the data. Now, there are some sources of errors which are original research articles. What I'm showing here is the same author, Singh et al, published identical compound, which is AM8191 in two different papers. One is in 2014 and one is in 2015. In one paper, they mentioned that and in the second paper, they mentioned that it is Hergeis 50 is 18 nanomole. So again, in this case, the database guys, database extractor, they did not make any mistake. They pulled out the numbers, what they see in the paper. But when you see these kind of differences, specifically three log unit differences or six log unit differences, it should immediately click to you that there is something wrong with these numbers because the significant numbers are identical. What you are looking at is just the micromolar or nanomolar numbers. So we have to be very careful when you're looking at 18 nanomolar or 18 micromolar. When we built the model for Herg IC50, our model suggests that Herg IC50 value of this compound should be 18 nanomolar and not 18 micromolar. <clears throat> Another source of error is us. Us means the database here. <laughs> so what happens is, Many times, some these programs are designed in such a way that when you read the smiles or SD5, and if it has the extra salts or counter ions associated with those compounds, it is available as a single smiles notation or a single compound. But when these programs, like even admin predictor or other programs, actually, when they read these software, uh, when they read these smiles or SD5, they look at it in terms of, oh, this is extra salt or solvent, and it needs to be split it out. So they are designed to help the users to take care of the counter ions or the salts. But at the same time, user needs to be very careful when you're looking at these, uh, these uh, salts, these duplicates. For example, if you look at these compounds, this compound is by chemical structure, it is duplicate. And the LD50 for these two compounds, one is 810 mix per case, and one is 150 mix per case. But what we miss here is in one case, it is a citrate salt, and in one case, it is a pure compound. So we cannot compare, one cannot necessarily compare the activities or toxicities of different salts. You have to be careful when you're comparing or looking at the duplicates and you see, oh, there are duplicates with different numbers. They, that's the wrong data or there is something wrong in it. It is not. You are ignoring the salts or the solvents. Sometimes these numbers are pretty much similar. So if I see these compounds, we see there is no hardly some difference, like two, 290 versus 350. <coughs> difference but when you are looking at some phosphate salt and a regular one there is almost tenfold of difference or ninefold of difference so you have to be very careful when you are comparing the duplicates and just you cannot come to a conclusion that they are identical compounds and having different numbers so we are equally responsible we cannot just blame the data with data extractor or the authors we are equally responsible for looking at the data and last but not least, 
is a, I call it ABCD, which is automated and blind compilation of data. Now, this is something actually we um, are facing in a lot nowadays. So it is very tempting to automate the curation itself. So there are programs which you just look at the PDF file and extract the compounds and store it as SMILES or SD file. So this is a very good example. What we found is this compound 21 shows extracellular double bond in the original research article. So this is the Jim Atkin paper we are talking about. When we built a model, now this is, this data was extracted for rat plasma protein binding data. When we built the model, this compound always jumped out as an outlier. Even if we include it in the training set, the final prediction was always very off. So we, it, we started thinking what is going on in here. Most of the times, if you talk to QSCR people, they say, oh, this compound is always an outlier. We have to throw it out or we should not use that. But instead of that, if we can go back to the original paper and see what is going on, then you can find this the compound is reported in the paper as, as you can see, there is a double bond over here. So what this compound, the lower chemical structure has hidden the carbonyl oxygen, which is missing. When we corrected this chemical structure and added back to the database, then voila, our database, this compound was predicted perfectly fine. So this is what we call it as an ABCD. Like mostly you cannot just, there is, there are advantages of automation, no doubt about it. It helps a lot to fasten the process, but just be careful when you're looking at the data because of the, these automation, there is a possibility you're missing onto something and you have, you may ignore that compound just because, oh, this is a wrong compound or this is this is another example of ABCD. Actually, this is not very clear, but the this the compound what we are looking at is over here, number fifteen, which has R three as F. The R three group is over here. The phenyl group. This substitution is F, and the R one R two is, um, I think it is. Uh, there is a uh, piperazine or piperazine ring with uh, fluorine. But if you look at the compound 15 and compound 16, what the extractor has done is they have combined R1, R2, R3 group of 16 over here and fluorine group of R3 group of 15 over here. So this kind of um, mistakes are very common when we are looking at automated uh, program which extracts the data. So we need to be very careful about this kind of ABCD. Um, let's find out how, let's see how we can find them actually. This is what um, I'll be, I have few ideas that what we are using when we are extracting, when we extract the data and how, how do we find it. First of all, just look at the activity clips or toxicity clips. For example, this is a data which is available uh, from, I think, EPA or uh, EPA dashboard. It is a LD50 data, RAT LD50 data, which is available in milligrams per kilogram. Now, I tried to look and on specific compounds have seems to be very unusual because all of the compounds have very low toxicity, very high toxicity. Low number means high toxicity, and this compound doesn't. So the reference of this paper is very old. It is a 1984 paper. So till now, nobody has gone back to those papers. We don't know if that paper is available or not in the PDF format. But we somehow managed to get this paper 
and the compound number 89, which is shown over here, it corresponds to 0.322 milligram per kilogram. That means they have missed on the decimal point right before the entire number. And that's why actually you can see a huge activity uh, toxicity cliff when you're looking at this data. When you're looking at this data. Similar example I have is from other uh, set of compounds, which are, um, you can see that LD50 is almost 7,000 milligram per kilogram at seven gram. But if you look at 11 most similar structure of this compound, they are all again single digit numbers. Of course, in this case, we do not have the original reference. We couldn't get the original reference. But when we built the model, we removed this compound, put it in the test set, just for our understanding what is going on. We built the model of LD50 and find out that if we predict the toxicity of this compound, it comes in the range of six to 12. That means they have also missed on one decimal point, maybe up before, after seven over here. And so, if you have a data, just look at it in terms of activity clips or toxicity clips many times, you can immediately point out this compound has something, there is something wrong with this compound or there's something wrong with the biological activity or toxicity of this compound. That's how actually you can easily find out if there is anything wrong, anything um, wrongly reported or wrongly extracted. You can also run some molecular match pair analysis. For example, in, this is the data from our rat plasma protein binding data. And you can see that most of the match pair, most of the transformations here are nitrogen to carbon replacements, replacements or substitution. But the difference between the rat plasma binding in, in these cases is not very significant. But specifically, if you look at the first pair, the difference between rat FUP of these two compounds is very significant. So that triggers us an idea, okay, we have to go back to the original paper, look at it, what is going on. So there, if we can use various cheminformatics to, cheminformatics tools like toxicity clips or clustering or map molecular match pair analysis to find out if there is any, if the data is consistent or there are, if there is an inconsistency in the data. This is one approach we use a lot nowadays, actually. Um, if we have hundreds and thousands of compounds, what we do is leave one group completely out, build a model, and see how that group is predicted using our uh, the temporary or intermediate model. And what we see here is now, um, this is an example. We found that the units were reported in the database as microliter per minute per milligram of course. And when we built a model for without these groups, and then we found that these group these compounds are not predicted well. We back to the original paper, we found that the actual units in the paper are milliliters per minute per gram of liver. So whoever works in uh, clearance model building, they know that these two conversions need almost 50. There are some factors actually which are required to make these conversions, and those conversions were missing when the extractor, database extractor, or data extractor extracted the data. And it is very easy when you build the models without, with just like by leave one, leave group out instead of doing you leave one out or leave five out. It is kind of a cross validation for us as well. Similarly, in this case, what we noticed is there were a few set of compounds which were reported. There were unit uh, discrepancies by thousandfold. So our models predicted that our most of the compounds were over here, but there are a few sets of compounds which we found that they were predicted very low. When we looked at the paper and corrected the numbers, this is what we find that all the compounds have moved into the cluster, and these compounds have moved into the cluster. So, what we have found is if there, if by using live group out, if we see the difference of three log units or six log unit differences, then there is definitely the data extractor has messed up with the units, like instead of micromolar here. 
put it in micromolar to nanomolar or micromolar to nanomolar. So that kind of errors are very common in the databases. Now, this is another example, actually, when you when we are building a model for QCR, everybody thinks that we should have a wider range of IC50 values or PIC50 values. So what we see here is the data extractor did not, they just mentioned that, okay, this is PEC50 value, but PEC50 value needs a specific conversion, that is, it is minus log 10 to the, that kind of conversion was missing. Why? Because PEC50 value cannot be 0 0.078. PEC value, most of these PIC50 values or PEC50 values, they are in the range of 2 to 10 or 3 to 10 but less than one is definitely something which some whoever is building a model it should immediately ring a bell over there that oh, 0 0.078 doesn't seem to be a PEC50 value. But similarly, PIC50 value of 36 means it is, its IC50 value is in molar or even tens of molar. That is not actually the right, right number. So basically, we have to be careful when we are looking at few data points which are way out of the normal ranges. So when you're building the model, you should be aware what are the normal ranges of these set of compounds or these uh, properties. So we have to be careful. As I said, actually, we are equally responsible for data curation than we cannot just blame the data extractors. Now, this is another example. I was building a model called ratio of blood to plasma. And most of the times, the range is again 0.55 to maximum up to 1.5 or 2. I had these almost 300 data points. When I plotted them against our predicted human RBP value, we noticed that the experimental RBP value, there are 35 compounds having experimental RBP value of 1. And there are almost 22 compounds having experimental value of 0.55 or we go back to the so if you look at the chemical structures one is naloxone one is naloxifene they are pretty different chemical structures but yet they have rbp value of one similarly if you see indomethacine and others over here they are diverse chemotypes but again you see 0.55 so that doesn't that doesn't sound good actually it is we need to see what exactly is going on. So I went back to the original papers, and what we see here is actually disturbing because many authors they just mentioned that okay, no data available, value of one assumed for basic drugs. And people who have built these models in the past, they ignored it. They just looked at it, okay, RB value is one, let's use this value in building the QSA model. Now, same thing over here, like it says one for basic and 0.55 for acidic drugs, okay? Now, something that is more funny is this author, it says assume to be 0.55 and he has a reference of this paper, which is qubit et al. So somebody has used it, that's why I'm using these assumptions. That is something which is disturbing and more importantly, the people who are building the QSAR models using these kind of value, I really feel bad that people do not even care to look at those footnotes when there are specific numbers. If, they, if it rings a bell, look at the footnotes in those papers. There is something you will find. But finally, we just removed those compounds from our analysis and built a model. And then we found that, okay, yes, that was good. The last example, last uh, but not the least, actually, user experience. It is very important when somebody is building a model, his experience counts a lot. The example, what I'm showing here is provided by my colleague, who's Bob Clark. He was working with um, building a um, classification model or metabolism model for ester hydrolysis. So he looked at some compounds from the WDI, World Drug Index, and this is the drug, oh, 
I have a, I did not have a, I don't, oh yes, it is a proxy balloon. So, and it is available as pro drugs in the WDI as well. So mostly when, um, when he carried out the ester hydrolysis of these pro drugs, he came across that in one case, it was even numbered carbon chain. And in other case, okay, in this case, it was even number carbon chain. In this case, it was odd number carbon chain, which is very unusual because mammals have problems metabolizing the odd carbon long chain. So most of the pro drugs which are um, built in, they are with the even number carbon chain. And when he looked at it, it is odd carbon, odd number carbon long chain. Then he went back to the chemical structures. So if we look at this chemical structure and it's ester, it should be COO instead of having OCO. Actually, this is a reverse hydro. So the, even the World Drug Index database, they had messed up with these chemical structures when they uh, added the data. And if I was building these models, I would have never picked it up because I did not know about these problems related to metabolizing hot carbon or even carbon. So yes, user experience does count a lot when you're doing the data curation. Lastly, I just want to discuss why we should care about these data curation. So I'm going back to the original structure, original pictures which I showed you, that these are the two main um, news which, which had been in, Everybody believed them in dec for decades, but it's the fact that if a lie is repeated a thousand times, it becomes a truth. So in 1993, the original photographer of that Loch Ness monster, he admitted that he had made this monster out of some plastic and some clockwork and some toy submarine. That means the picture what appeared in 1934, it was a lie, it was a fake photo. Similarly, if you look at the Bigfoot news, in 19, it had been in the literature, it had been uh, there for in 40, since 40s or 50s until the original photographer's family revealed a secret saying that the whole thing was a hoax. Wallace had made the oversized footprints with a set of carved wooden feet. And so what happens is if these people had not revealed it, we would have never found out that these are the fake news. But what happened in between is these news have become so much of a truth. These are the news in 2017. People have still been going over there to find out the Loch Ness Monster. So it is a record year for citing the Loch Ness Monster. People still believe there is monster over there or uh, people still believe there is a big food site in California. So you, and once it has been in the news or once it has been there for so many decades, people don't believe that it's a lie. It just becomes truth. And this is what actually we fear a lot in terms of chemistry as well. Let's look at the example now, amiodarone and amiodarone hydrochloride. So amiodarone is a simple, so, so what we are looking at is amiodrone structure. Solubility of amiodrone is shown to be 700 milligrams per liter. And this, these are the snapshots from PubChem database actually. And the literature, the back reference is Merkindex, which we believe that it is an official record. And if we look at its salt again, we see that it's salt, the solubility of salt is 700 mix per, mix per liter as well. And again, the same reference, page 85, page 85. But if we notice, actually, everybody who, who works with chemistry, he knows that the solubility of the plain molecule and its hydrochloride salt or any salt, it cannot be identified. When my colleague Bob Clark was building the solubility models for our admit, using Admit Modeler, the pro program consistently found it as an outlier. So its nominal solubility of 0.7 mg per ml or 700 mg per liter is to, we found that this is less, actually the, uh, it is predicted to be less actually. 
compared to what the what the reports say because we build a model only on plane molecules not with hydrochloric salts so unless we go back if we build the model and we find out that this is an outlier we could have never found out that there is something discrepancy in these two structures and these are actually an official records in merck index is official record another example which my other colleague marvin waldman found out is about the pentazine many of you may know or many of you not know actually this compound is a non-existent compound this compound doesn't exist okay but it got into well it got into the literature for computational work trying to rationalize the fact that it doesn't exist so they just designed a compound carried out some computational studies showed that it doesn't it cannot exist even then it has a cast number and surprisingly it is available on the pubkin if you go to pubkin site it is available by the chemical vendors if chem if there are few chemical vendors they are ready to sell this non-existing compound now what happens is once that happened this becomes a virtual virtually real compound and somebody will ask so what is how is it going to matter now how it is going to matter in terms of drug design here is something if you just follow these biosteric replacements so diazepam and bromazepam there is simple biosteric replacement where group in fact and how it is in terms of ai people just ignore to look at the chemical structures and just go on building the models designing the virtual library of compounds hundreds of thousands of like compounds library so i won't be surprised down the line someone designs compound wherein they have replaced the phenyl ring with this pentazine ring because this exists in from chem or uh, this is uh, you can buy it so why not design it so we have to be very careful actually when we are looking at these kind of data and whoever is using this actually i'm afraid down the line people will start using these even if it is non-existing compound they will start designing the compounds using these fragments and i did not mention actually the pubchem website itself mentions that it is a hypothetical compound and another example actually which is uh, my favorite this is another example from pubchem so it, this is a chemical compound which is a part of a pubchem 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 database it has a molecular weight molecular formula and the reference reference is united states patent so this compound is extracted from the patent and the patent reads lipopolyamines and preparations and uses there so if you look at lipopolyamine structures these are the structures which are lipopolyamine structures so there is nothing wrong with these structures these are all the so this patent includes all the lipopolyamines and the substances or the raw materials that are used to synthesize them so where does this big compound come from the only graphics that looks very similar to this existing compound is a bar chart depicting comparison of trans transaction transfection efficiencies now what happens is how did i come how did i why do i think that it is the same compound okay, let's look at it it has 19 carbon it is 19 by 11 grid and we have it as a 19 by 11 grid and they also have these little spikes pointed as carbons or methyls so and there is no other graphic in the entire patent which will tell you that this compound is exist this compound is from that pattern i this is i'm saying it is an assumption but i'm pretty sure this is the only graphics from which it gets and how do we get that i already mentioned about abcds automated and blind data curation or curation of data there are programs which just look at those pdf files and if see if it sees some graphics it just translates it into the chemical structure without knowing that 
it is if it the compound can exist or not. So these are the wages of automated and blind curation of data. Now, actually, um, something I like to mention, people asked me a lot after my last presentation at GRC, can we automate this process? And yes, we can, but we have to be very careful that when you are looking at the data, it is what I, whatever I have shown you is fake data or wrong data, but there are black swans available. So yes, it does. It, there are some news which are real. For example, this fossil fish news, it does, it is a real news. You have to be very careful when you are differentiating between fake and real news. And this is the example which I show actually. This is the example of black swan in terms of chemistry. So I showed you activity clips before which were fake, but it's not necessary that activity clips are always fake because now this compound versus these two compounds, they have four points, they have IC50, herb IC50 of four, PIC50 in four, but this compound has very high um, PIC50. But this is possible. The reason behind that is most of the herb IC50 values are the acidic group on compounds is responsible for the it affects the herb IC50 value today. So yes, these kind of data, this kind of black swans do exist in chemistry. You have to be careful about it. Many people asked me at Gordon Conference. Many people ask me, can we automate the data? Years back, and that is an automated curation procedure. But what authors missed here, again, as I showed, I don't want to show the names of the authors, but you can definitely go back over there and find out. Um, what authors missed here is, for example, in this case, actually, this is one example that the compounds lost the aromaticity when they carried out the automated curation of thousands of data, thousands of compounds. They ignored to look at the structures at the end if there are any discrepancies or they did not match the initial structure and the final structures. They lost the aromaticity or they also found that the initial structure was an iodide salt, but finally the curation process just combined. It just made a covalent bond, covalent bond between sulfur and iodine. And this is not only example actually. These are not the only examples. There are many examples in this curation process. I have looked into the, my colleague Marvin has looked into these data. And he found that there are many compounds which have lost their aromaticity, or there are many compounds for which you can see the covalent bonds between sulfur and iodines. So I understand automation is necessary, but at the same time, you have to be very careful when you're using the automation and you have to compare or at least do some sampling when you're doing the final structure comparison. So, it's what I always talk about that like when you are building a model, it's up to you if you want to have an extraordinary model or if you want to have just extra and an ordinary model. It all depends on how you curate the data. So you want to validate the data or not to validate the data, it's completely up to you. But whatever efforts you take in pre-processing or data curation, it is going to make a difference in your model which is extraordinary or extra and ordinary. So um, this is the conclusion which I want to mention here is watch out for the ABCDs. I showed a few examples of ABCDs actually. And you, when you are doing a data curation or data cleaning, you have to watch out for those actually. And we have to be very vigilant 
about using the by activity when you, when we are using the by activity databases or the compilations we cannot simply use these just get the data and build the models it doesn't work this day many people think that qsr is just push button approach it is not actually there is a lot goes behind building the qsr model i also mentioned automation is necessary but it could be dangerous as i have shown you an example that we have to be careful at least do a random sampling of looking at the structures after automated curation and finally this is i have been telling everybody that if you see something say something not now maybe down the line the example which i showed about fantasy if we don't mention it to others there is a possibility that after a few years somebody will definitely come up with those kind of compounds which i showed you so it is necessary at least spread a word if we can contact the database guys of course we should tell them that this is wrong we should take it out or at least make some um, i would say note over there that this compound is opcam has made a note that it is hypothetical compound but people do ignore it so we have to be very careful and as they say we don't plant pears for us we plant the pears for our pears so we have to be vigilant and we have to mention about it to them so what i mentioned uh, what i spoke about today these are not only my own examples actually the entire simulations plus came informatics team had been involved in doing all these data curations i'm just talking in, on their behalf so bob clark marvin marvin mike bolger robert david and michael along with eric and john they have been always um supportive and they have been working on the data curations along with me as well so and of course i'd like to thank the open force field initiative team who have given me a chance to uh, speak on this topic actually uh, for this open force field initiative thank you so much and i did not mention on the similar topics whatever i discussed about the data curation or model building we are hiring on the same hiring for the same uh, task actually so we have a position open for postdoc as well thank you so i have a question about i mean so i, I very much you know think what you're doing is great but I, i'm curious like so a lot of it kind of relies on noticing things that are obviously crazy which is which is really great for things that are obviously crazy but I wonder about the things that are not obviously crazy that are probably also wrong, or at least some of them are wrong. Like I can tell you, I saw a coyote on my run this morning, a bobcat on my run this morning, and it's not obviously crazy because sometimes I see them, but I didn't actually see either today. So, like the same thing for chemistry, like you know, so you have stuff there with bad valence or whatever, and it creates huge outliers. But, mm -hmm. but what about things that are also wrong, but they aren't wildly wrong? What do we do about those? How do we catch them? Um, what are the what are the things about yeah. wrong? But is not there any hope for catching errors that are not as bad? So like wrong comma, um, but it doesn't create a huge outlier. Um, they yes, I completely agree that the, the um, solutions or how to find the find these errors, whatever I mentioned, they won't be able to catch them out. Specifically, if you have a compound which is very, it is not very bad, and it is not impacting the thing. So, sir, there, if you are building a model and you are doing some clustering, some most of the times it just, it definitely gives you an indication that there is something wrong. But yes, we do miss that kind of compound as well sometimes, because it is very, um, very rare case actually. I think. At least in our case, whatever data we are looking at, we did not come across any of those kind of uh, data points. I think points. we might have just accidentally muted our audio. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think we muted ourselves for a minute. Apologies, Zoom. Um, okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Yes. So I'm kind of new to medicinal chemistry, but I had heard a lot about activity clips, and at first I thought that they were all 
this kind of data errors. And then later I thought, oh wow, these are real and people have studied them really hard. Yes. And now I'm hearing again that maybe several of them are data errors. Can you, since you probably looked at a lot of these, can you give some insight into like what fraction of activities that you found are, are real when you dug in and what fraction are kind of like the trend by the The question is, uh, what fraction of activity coefficient activity cliffs are data errors versus real? We'll take questions from Jim. So um, what I realized is it's most of the times if you are looking at the data from the databases, you have to be careful about the activity cliffs. So I cannot mention about the um, activity cliff fractions because I just showed you an example which are actually a real activity cliffs. So um, and I I think there have been few groups working from Europe. They have been working on activity cliffs a lot, actually. So, but I would say with 50-50 chances that there are chances that some of the activity cliffs are real, actually. And we did come across those. But if they are affecting your model a lot, then you have to look at those seriously and just go back to the original paper and find out if they are right. But again, you never know if the author has made any mistake because we should, we saw the example in one of the slides that author also makes a mistake. So if your model is definitely telling you that this is an outlier or this is this is something uh, suspicious data, you can definitely reach out to the author of the paper just to clarify your doubts. Are there questions from Zoom? Anybody? No questions from Zoom, I don't think. Other questions from the room? Yes, please. So, the errors you find, and then basically, are, are they fixed in the database? And you see the feedback to the, to the database? We, um, so we do contact the authors, like, for example, this automation paper, what I showed in the last, we did contact the authors actually, and the author has, sometimes authors or the database administrators, they take it positively, they do accept that, yes, that was a mistake. But uh, one of my colleague approached these uh, PubChem guys actually, about the, the big grade molecule I showed you, about that kind of molecule, but PubChem guys did not actually, PubChem guys said, okay, we still want to keep them in the database, they want to remove it. So sometimes we have positive responses. Sometimes people say, okay, I, I know they are wrong, but we want to keep them. So there are certain, we have to take them with a pinch of salt. Sometimes like this. Okay, sorry, the question was, if these errors, which I have shown in the, on the slides, they, were, they have been taken care by the database people or not. Sorry, I should have mentioned that before. Yeah. Last chance for people on Zoom. Jeff? Was it resting on the molecule labeled as a racemic mixture, or did they have any other instances? Which paper? The, 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 the graph paper molecule. The big the grid molecule. molecule. Oh, the big grid molecule. Serious, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are all, I don't think it's a, well, yeah, the, it does have some kind of carbon. But all of them are, I would say, um, Cyclobutanes combined to each other, so fused cyclobutane rings all over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you.